Hi, I'm Maria Mamed, and you're watching Uni TV, your window into university life. This episode, we put sport under the spotlight in What's News. Our students also bring power and water to a remote community in hands on Vanuatu. We also get the lowdown in what employees are looking for in graduates in UNSW's Careers Expo. But first, let's find out about personal finance in uni life. Hi and welcome to Uni Life for everything you need to know about being a student. This week we're talking about money management and with me is our expert panel of students. Raj from Medicine, Sophie from Law, Amy from Arts and Education and Pete from Commerce and Law. So you've come to Uni and you're your own financial manager. You're dealing with things like rent, food, accommodation, bills, transport. How do you handle it? That's when you start to spend more than you're making. Guys, are you good with your money? How do you try and stay on top of things? Raj? Well, I come from a business family, so they've taught me quite a few good tips on burning money and making pretty poor investments. I went on exchange in my third year of uni, so I had no choice but to save. But it all worked out worthwhile. I'm pretty good at saving. I have a savings and a spending account, but I do have the tendency to blow my money on some pretty bad impulse buys. Mm. I'm not too bad at saving either. I work every weekend, but I've noticed my main expenditures become food and coffee these days. Well, do you guys have any stories about money spending excesses? Well, I get paid uh, once a fortnight, so I generally live, for a, live like a king for about a, a week and then I sort of struggle and start having to scavenge for food and cut costs on all sorts of things and live a, a kind of debauched lifestyle until I get paid <laughs> again. A friend of mine is obsessed with shoes. She's always spending money on shoes, but this means she can't spend money on public transport, which is a bit of a disaster in making it to class on time. I had a friend who saved all semester for a new computer, but he blew it all when he spent $500 shouting everyone drinks at the end of session party. I was bidding for a couple of suits on eBay, and uh, I ended up getting the suits, and they were about two sizes too small. All right, thanks guys. Well, if you need some help handling your money, here's some advice to keep in mind. Firstly, get a grip. Make a list of what you're spending, write it down so then you can see where your money's going and what you still need to save for. Secondly, you can try and set yourself a monthly budget to stick to. Thirdly, try and try and control those impulse buys. I know it's hard, but you've got to crack down on yourself. Although you're young, wild and free, try and save. Put a bit of money aside each month along with a high interest bank account. You'll reap the benefits in the future. Alright, so for more money tips and info, check out the Australian Government website, fido.gov.au. And if your money troubles are really starting to get you down, you can speak to UNSW Counselling. Their website's counselling.unsw.edu.au. Well, guys, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you next time on Uni Life. Hi, I'm Amy from the Uni of New South Wales, and this is What's News. So our big story up for debate today is the growing problem of violence in Aussie sport. Over the past few weeks, Australia's premier sports stars have been splashed across the front pages of newspapers for all the wrong reasons, including Brett Stewart, Brett Seymour, Anthony Watmo, Nick Darcy, the list goes on. So Jeremy went out and about on campus to see what the students had to say about all the controversy. Hi, I'm here reporting from Upper Campus at the University of New South Wales. We're here to talk about sports, so why don't you follow me? Do you think generally like athletes are more violent than uh, regular people or are they kind of no. similar? No, just... I think they just have an outlet to yeah. be violent in. Oh yeah, in the heat of the moment I suppose, maybe. Yeah. yeah. But that's all adrenaline. I wouldn't say so. Would you say, uh, with our media coverage, uh, that uh, the general Australian media has a tendency to pick on athletes a little bit more when it comes to personal lives, like with the whole Brett Stewart incident? Yeah, well, Australian media, they pick on anyone they want to. They don't... They're just looking for a story, they're just looking for a hype, they're just looking for a sale. The media just want to sell papers, and yeah. where they can make a buck, they will. Yeah, I have no idea who Brett Stewart is. Do you reckon that the media is uh, kind of fair in how they cover people like the athletes? Or? Yes. 
Thank you, Jeremy. Some interesting opinions from our students. So these headlines about sportsmen's sexual abuse and violence, they've obviously done something wrong for there to be a story, but is the press blowing it way out of proportion because of the high profile status of these stars? And is the focus on sport hiding the more widespread problem of male bad behaviour towards women in society as a whole? To find an answer, I headed off to our Journalism and Research Centre to speak to Professor Catherine Lumby, who not only is a feature columnist on this subject, but is also a member of the Education and Welfare Committee of the NRL. So there's been a lot of press attention lately with the numerous sports stars regarding sexual abuse allegations and general bad behaviour. Do you think that the press are blowing it out of proportion? No, I don't think they're blowing it out of proportion. Um, I mean, I think we should be absolutely concerned whenever we see young men behaving in this way. And Catherine, do you think there's a wider underlying problem with men's behaviour as a whole in society and it's not just sportsmen who are to blame? Oh, there's absolutely a wider problem. Um, you know, we know that sexual assault and domestic violence remain really widespread across all walks of life, it must be said, in all classes. Well, I'd invite people to find out about the history of what happens in elite university colleges to young women. I'd invite people to go and spend some time talking to people who work at Rape Crisis New South Wales, who will tell you that violence against women and children cuts right across our society and that we all need to do more about standing up against it, about educating boys from really primary school age on about the impacts of violence against women. Um, it's, it's something that we, I think we're only at the beginning of taking responsibility for. And I'd like to see men taking responsibility for this, not just women. An interesting viewpoint from Catherine on issues in society as a whole. But what about these young sportsmen with fame, fortune and money? Are they really more violent than the average Joe? Or is it the press to blame? I spoke to Dr Cliff Evers, who specialises in the research of young men, their sexuality and the media, to see what he had to say. Why do some young men have behavioural problems? Is it too much testosterone overpowering their rationale and sensibility? I never say it's just about testosterone, because the problem is that gives everyone an excuse then if they behave bad. They say, oh, I, I, I just have too much testosterone, and then they wouldn't have to take responsibility for their actions. What happens is testosterone mixes with other parts of your life. So it mixes with your, what you learn at school or university. It mixes with what you learn if you're religious and the moral behaviours you, you, you learn. Uh, it mixes, you learn things through sport. When you're playing sport, for instance, you know, your teammates uh, your coaches, etc. Regarding the sports stars and all the controversy in the news lately, with all the fame and attention, would you say they are more violent than your regular man on the street, or are they victimised by the press because of their high profile status? I don't think they're more violent uh, than the average person on the street. I mean, if you look at sexual assault by males, it's predominantly done by people within a family, not by a stranger. Um, so it's a case of when something happens, say with a football star, um, they are high profile, the media picks up on it, um, and people talk about the issues through that sports star. So there you have it, the issue of violence in sport cleared up by our very own experts here at UNSW. That's all from me, Amy, once more. But I hope to see you next time as we attack the biggest issues of the day in What's News. Bye. Solar energy that reaches the Earth's surface in just one day exceeds humankind's total energy requirements for 30 years. Hi, I'm Andrew Tai and I'm a student from the School of Federal Takes and Renewable Energy Engineering at the University of New South Wales. And with those stats on our side, the future looks bright. Of course, harnessing the power from the sun is a challenge, but technology is rapidly coming to the party. The city is a sea of rooftops, the perfect place to capture that all-important sunlight. Today I've been working on a standalone photovoltaic system that has been designed for use as a remote area power supply. You see, part of our undergraduate program is a hands-on trip to a remote location in a developing country. We went to an amazing village in Vanuatu called Lowen. It was a day's trek in, so we had to be sure we didn't leave anything behind. Here our job is to install a photovoltaic system where previously there has been no power. This is exactly the kind of system we installed in Vanuatu. It's incredibly efficient, but there's always room for some fine tuning. 
The system generates electricity from sunlight in DC form, which is ideal as batteries also store electricity in DC form. Unfortunately, the energy we need to power most appliances require AC electricity, so an inverter is connected to the system, which allows us to convert the DC electricity from the battery into a usable AC form. So this is our charge controller here. It just acts as the gateway between our battery and our solar panel here. And it just mediates between the electricity of both of them. We have a current issue at the moment where these light globes won't all turn on at the same time. But that's because they just use too much power and our regulator just switches it off as a safety mechanism. But in Vanuatu, we're just going to switch over to the energy saving light globes just to prolong their life. In Vanuatu, another big issue was that the villagers would also hook things up directly to the battery, bypassing the regulator. So we had to create a battery box where the regulator and battery were kept in a locked enclosure, only accessible by the chief's son. We spent a week living in the village, installing the system, helping out with the plumbing, and generally coming to grips with the impact that a solar power system would have on such a remote community. It was a real privilege, it was a fantastic experience and it continues to drive me to bring green technology to developing countries around the world. How does the iconic surf culture of Australia's beaches connect with the artistic beauty of the Islamic world? Sydney artist and lecturer Philip George has combined his passion for surfing with decades of study of the art of Islam. His work is on show at the Kasula Powerhouse. Australia is a country of migration and immigration and this show is actually acknowledging Aussie surf culture and this incredible beauty of Islamic art and, and mapping those two things together to make something that maybe couldn't happen anywhere else in the world. I've been into Ottoman mosques, Persian mosques and Arabic mosques and I'm just struck by the, just the, the wonderful beauty of the mosque. The Islamic tile patterns are talking about the tree of life, the Garden of Eden. It's very uplifting, it's a very uplifting place. I tried to bring it into an Australian context by putting the wonderment into and onto an iconic surfboard. The borderland of Australia is the beach. And when you're in the water, you're not a businessman, you're not an academic, you're not an artist, you're not a, a plumber. You're in the surf and, and you're sort of stripped back of all of those cultural representations. So in a way it's a neutral space. The surfboard is an artwork, the, the Inshallah surfboard will never be ridden. It's actually paying homage to and, and respecting Islam. But also Inshallah means God willing. In the surf people are waiting to see Yui, the wave god. So when you say to uh, guys in the water, inshallah, God willing, they get it straight away. They understand, ah right, we are reliant on the surf god or the gods of the water and the ocean, the wind, to get a wave out here. And also, inshallah, we won't get eaten by a shark. Inshallah, we'll get a good wave. So it's speaking back to the Australian community saying, we're here too. We're part of the surf culture. We're part of the Australian scene. It's not saying we're different, we're just here and accept the, the diversity that is, is a joyful diversity of Australia.
Hi, I'm Jeremy from UniTV and as you can see I'm here in my Sunday best. Now, I'm here at the UNSW Careers Expo for one reason and that is to find out what your high powered employee is looking for in their graduate. So, if you care, follow me. I'm just talking with Rachel. First question, what do you look for in your uh, graduate? I guess probably the, the main things that we look for in a graduate is obviously a good attitude, someone that aligns with our company values. Yeah. We look for people who've got good academic results. Yeah. So we're looking for people who've got round about a credit average, 65 or above. We're looking for strong communication skills. One still is ideally looking for someone with future leadership potential. And we're looking for people with a few extracurricular activities, which means we're looking for people who can show us that university is not everything in their life, and people who are really motivated, enthusiastic, and the right attitude. What really makes you sit up and pay attention? What makes a student stand out in the crowd? I guess someone who comes up to the stand has already done a little bit of research about the company and starts asking intelligent questions about what specific uh, positions do we have on our graduate program. You definitely notice when students are more prepared. They come up with direct questions. They know which uh, stream they would like to apply into, whether it be HR or finance. So someone who has an understanding of what they're looking for. Someone who has a firm handshake. That's something that's good. And someone who remembers our names. Someone who would say, thank you, Karina, for your help today. That's someone you keep in mind. Someone that comes straight up to us and has a little bit of an understanding about us already because you know, we're proud to work for our company and we care about the people that actually know about us already. How should one prepare themselves for a career expo? I suppose research the organisations or the industry that they're interested in. Sit down and think about what do they want to get out of it. If you're serious about getting a job, I'd suggest you do a bit of research into who's attending and uh, go, to the, go to those people's websites and get a bit of background and then target those specific companies and ask them some intelligent questions so you can make, make an impression. What are some of the best or most memorable or uh, worst questions you've uh, ever been asked at one of these things? It's probably, again, just the people that have become well prepared, that are genuinely interested in like contractors, what we do, and just want to have a chat and find out a bit more about it. I think one of the most funny questions I had was probably someone who was asking me how much they have to pay for an application. The worst question would be, what careers do we have an offer? And uh, we have a big sign here that says electrical. So the best one was probably, why should I work for some Um Because they really put me on my toes and it was like, well, we've got some, some really great great opportunities for graduates and I had to come up with, you know, why we're different to, uh, I suppose, other organisations. Well, there was a lot of good advice there from a lot of powerful organisations. But I guess if we're going to walk away from this with one thing, be prepared. Do your research, walk in there and know what you want. So uh, if you'll excuse me, I've, uh, I've got to find a job. Well thanks for that Jeremy, that's some great advice from the expert. We'll have more of Careers Expo next time, but that's all for now. This is Murray Mamet and you're watching UniTV.